these days so that people can uh, this is a term used to how do we understand human language and how do we teach machines human language so to start with there are two major schools of thought in natural language processing like two major ideas which people have followed they are known as compositional and vector space vector space models again more than throwing words at you the, i just wanted to give an introduction to how things are working these days so that you know the nuts and bolts of how these ai models work so that you can use it in your own tasks for example the first school of thought is learning language from context for example consider the word bank so as you know the bank word can mean a bank a financial institution or a river bank now how do we as a human know which meaning the word bank is if a person says i went to a bank to withdraw some cash you immediately know the meaning of the bank he is referring to is a financial <laughs> institution and the way we learn that is from context essentially not just the word bank but we look around the words around it i went to a bank to withdraw some cash so then in your mind there is a mental mapping for the word bank with two different kind of possibilities which is one is possibly a financial institution and the other one is a river bank but the moment you hear cash you associate that with the bank the financial institution on the other hand if your friend tells you i went to the bank and did some fishing you probably understand that he's probably talking about fishing on a river bank so this is how humans learn language from context based on context and this is exactly what all these large language models are doing these days now how do they do it so the way they do it is if you're if you give it a big sentence i love this movie it's sweet but with such satirical humor a bunch of sentences in a paragraph the large language model just breaks it down into individual words that is the very first step it does and the next thing it does is let's look at how many times this word occurs let's say you know the occurs four times it occurs six times etc so that is one way that machines are making sense of the big words and sentences we throw at them this is a kind of example of one of like initially like 10 years ago this is how we used to feed this knowledge into neural networks we let's say there is a movie review which says this movie is very scary and long not slow spooky good okay basically these were the words in a given set of movie reviews for a given movie let's call it transformers movie and now we would tell the machine that hey is in the second review is is occurred two times in the first review this occurred only once this occurred only the word this occurred only once so on and so forth so basically humans were manually doing this we were trying to find and tell the machines what is a good heuristic to let the machine know hey give and give more attention to this particular word but that was 10 years ago now the machine does it all by themselves so this is what i mean by vector space models these days we take the meaning of every single word and project it into an imaginary vector space simply a space of vectors and the idea here is that when people did this when they took the meaning of these words and projected into a vector space researchers found out that queen if the word queen is closer to king they also found that using the same analogy they were able to find that um carlos can you admit the people um i just did one person okay so their idea was they started finding all these analogies automatically that the machine is learning so they asked the machine hey if i give you queen and if if i give you king the meaning of queen meaning of king 
And how do you understand this? And the, what the machines found out or humans found out and told the machines was that if you take the vector for woman, add it with the vector of king, but reduce the vector of man from it, you will arrive at the vector of queen. And then they went back and checked the actual vector of queen, and that was exactly the same. So that was like an aha moment in the history of learning languages and natural language processing that we just discovered a way to tell machine what is meaning. Or in this case, what is relative meaning? What does the word queen mean in, re in relation to king? For example, if the machine has learned the meaning of king, how do we tell it what a queen is? Or rather, if the machine had only learned the meanings of king, woman, and man, how do we tell it what a queen is? And the way we told machines is here, queen is woman plus king minus man, the exact vectors of it. So this was one of the very starting points of learning language, of teaching machines language. Now, this is a second school of thought, which actually happened almost 50 years ago. This is what everybody, linguists and Noam Chomsky and great linguists were initially suggesting that we need to make the machines learn composition. And the definition of composition is you, what you would know as grammar. So if you remember your childhood, the way you learned a new language or even like your native language is first you learn these indiv individual words as you grow up. Let's say in this sentence, I prefer the morning flight through Denver. You would have learned what morning is. You would have learned what flight is. And when, then you kind of start building sentences by putting these words together. Or in other words, you start building the meanings of these words, compose them using grammar. This is all very subconscious. I'm pretty sure we did not learn grammar un until like, maybe what's, I don't, even, I don't know in the US, maybe I'm gonna say third grade, but it's not like we were not speaking until third grade, right? We were already speaking it, speaking the language, but somehow we were able to combine these words and meanings and learn the structure from it. So this was the original school of thought in machine learning that, hey, sure, this is how humans learn. Let's try teaching machines how to learn that. But sadly that failed because of a reason that, if you can remember, N subject, N subject stands for, it's just like a standard notation in linguistics. Every sentence has a subject, it has a modifier, object, and things like that. But what happened was when we tried feeding all this knowledge as vectors into the machine learning model, the model just exploded. It's basically saying, I don't have so much memory to understand all these subject verb objects. So in the early to 2010, people were figuring out how do we even make the machines learn language? That's when somebody thought of this idea, let's break it down into sentences find, let's say, number of, let's break down the sentences into words, find features. In this case, the feature happens to be the number of times a word occurs. Project that into a vector space and tell that to the machine. And surprisingly, that just took off because combined with the fact that uh, people started, People already knew about neural networks, but then people started making the connection. The researchers started making the connection that the neural network or a collection of software-based neurons was the perfect tool to teach machine this kind of instances. But all the linguists have been com complaining all this while that, but the machine is really not learning anything. It is probably just memorizing stuff because it is not really learning a sentence, but it is just learning a bunch of words. So sad truth, yes, these days all large language models are just learning a bunch of words and not the structure, but they are doing amazingly well, so nobody is complaining. But there is also another school of thought, like another research that's happening parallelly known as quantum AI or quantum NLP, which is my research topic where we are introducing grammar back into the sense into the learning process. And I can talk about that in, a, in another lecture. 
So let's come back to typically what kind of tasks do we do in natural language processing? One is classifying whole sentences. For example, if you get a sentence or an email and how do we know or how does the machine know whether, whether it is spam or a good email that should be sent to an inbox? So that is the task known as classifying whole sentences or sentence classification. Yeah, if you, I don't know how many of you know this, but long time ago, there was this email sent by a supposedly Nigerian prince who was saying, hey, I'm abdicating my throne. You want all my treasures? Just email me back with your bank account. And a lot of people fell for that. And especially the older generation who thought that that was real. This was before the spam filters were invented. Of course, email came first and then the phishing or spam filters. And the, this joke is like people used to think, oh my God, I hope he's fine and things like that. So they all send their bank account, find the money drain out of the bank account. So clearly now we don't, that doesn't happen because we have AI based filters looking for, looking out for us. Some other typical tasks is classifying each word in a sentence. For example, if you are given a word, given a sentence, Washington DC is the capital of United States. What is Washington DC? Is it a place? Is it a, is it a entity? Is it a thing? So that kind of classification also we have AI models good at doing it. We saw the third one generating text content where we, you know, Tucson is known for was the sentence we gave to the transformers based model. And it said it, Tucson is known for marijuana amongst other things. So that is the, or this is of course what you know, know as chat GPT, right? The generative models. Um, the other, the other util, utilities include extracting answer from a text also known as question answering generating a new sentence from an input text, pretty much like prompting what you will do in, in GPT. So why are we talking about all this? We're talking about all this to understand how do humans learn a language? And the way, like I mentioned earlier, we learn with initially a meaning of a word. And the next thing we do is we build up with the flow of meaning and we learn context from new examples. However, if you take out one and two, the meaning, learning the meaning of a word and building up a sentence, three is the only thing which currently AI models are doing, which is learning context from new examples. So if you are using all the three, humans probably need only two examples after knowing the meaning of bank, which is bank as a river bank and bank as a financial institution, not three trillion, which is three trillion is a number of parameters of, or sentences, uh, roughly the sentence is more than that. The number of sentences that is fed into GPT these days just to learn. So I just, I'm trying to give you guys this rough idea that this is how the current AI models are learning. But since it's learning only from context, it needs so many of these sentences to learn all these nuances or shades of meaning. Now, this still is a hard task. Right, because if you think about it, the machines don't really process information the same way as humans do, right? So text needs to be processed. If you have a sentence which is saying, I am hungry, the text needs to be processed or minimally broken down. And you need to, you as a human, at least when we were designing these models, we have we had to think carefully about how this is processing. For example, the word, okay, look at the sentence here, as I was saying, so the question then is, do you want machine to learn the word meaning of the word saying or its root, which is say? Because if it learns the root say, then we can make it to learn things like said, uh, saying, and all, all the gerunds and present and past tense. So there's a lot of pre-processing that we need to do in language. So of course, all these large language models do that, do this pre-processing. And transformers is fundamental to all these large language models. That's what it's built on. And all these companies learn or use transformers in one way or the other. A little bit of history, if you see like 2018 was the first GPT, and this is all like short history of transformers, all the way to BERT is essentially another big model 
um, and all these things, like even th this is like ends in 2021, but of course now we know GPT-4 and other language models, everything is built on transformers. So these transformers are trained on large amount of raw text. If you remember from last class, if we just feed it, feed the entire internet onto transformers. And it is it learns using something known as supervised learning. And the way it does is, if you remember this example from last class, which is cruise control and a constant feedback mechanism between the expected speed and current speed. And we do this whole back propagation idea. And the difference in the desired values is what is back propagated through the neural network. So if you remember the example was, here, is, here are the sentences which have cats and dogs. So initially the machine learns, you know, meaning of cat is same as dog. Then it tries, when you give it a new sentence, a uh, dash, a blank has whiskers, it starts predicting initially dog. And then we tell it, no, the right answer is cat has whiskers. And then the difference in terms of vectors, and that's why I, I introduced vectors earlier, the difference in terms of vectors is what is back propagated or sent back through this whole neural network. We saw this earlier that all language models, large language models these days are just trained on the entire internet. So one way, one, one particular way of training language is known as causal language modeling, where we first ask, give it one word, my, and ask it to predict the next word, it says name. So now we go back, we ask it my name and predict the next word, it says is. So this is known as autoregressive kind of model where we keep going back and forth and ask the model itself to predict the next word. So this is one way of training the model. Another way is masking. Essentially, we put a my mask or blank is Sylvain. And the, you know, and the, let's say the machine initially predicts my dad is Sylvain. And then we tell machine, nope, it should be name. So the difference between dad and name, it learns and back propagates. That's a very minimal example. But if you expand that in your head into the internet level, it can keep learning all these multiple combinations. My blank is Sylvain, my blank is Sylvain, et cetera, et cetera, keeps finding. And it learns how many times is name filled up as opposed to let's say the word dad. So that is a kind of rough learning that the, that the models do. So also in this graph, this is the y, x axis is the is time and the y axis is the number of parameters. It's essentially, you can look at the number of words. So you can see that, you know, in 2020, this was 200,000 in GPT, it's probably a trillion at this point, the number of words it needs to learn, which of course is because it's learning from context only. So which is also a long time to train because, you know, uh, and which essentially translates to carbon dioxide emissions. Um, if you can see like a round trip from, from New York to San Francisco emits only 900 CO2 emissions kilogram per kilograms, while training a large language models is 75,200 carbon emissions. So there's a, lot, there's a big push towards, you know, the, something else other than large language models also. But in this class, we are mostly learning deep learning. So I'll stick to large language models. So even in training large language models, and which is what we are going to do today, there are three types of training. First is pre-training. Pre-training is essentially the one we talked about, which is take the whole internet or a huge data set, give it to this big mechanism or architecture known as transformers, uh, go back and forth. So let's see. Transfer learning, meanwhile, is essentially saying, let's train the model in this case, it happens to be something known as CNN, a convolutional neural network. Let's train and train it only on cats and dogs. Let's see if we can ask it to predict truck or a car. Like, is it is there? We are taking a step back from the sentences which contain cats and dogs, and we are saying, what is car and truck? Can you learn something from that? Another type is like this, oh, this is what I mentioned, pre-training, which is lots of very large corpus, number of days of training. Uh, you know, I think GPT-4 was trained for weeks, if not a month, a um, lot of compute money required. And then there is fine tuning. The idea is that let's take a big model like GPT and let's train it on a small data set. For example, let's say you have a data set of rare diseases. 
And let's say you are the only one on earth who has that data set, or it's very rarely found on the internet. There's so many of these new words, but you don't, the, this pre-trained model, let's say GPT does not really know it because it has never seen it. Even if it saw 100 examples of these rare words and rare diseases symptoms, it is nothing when compared to the 3 trillion words and sentences on the internet. So the amount of weightage that these machines gave to that word is very less if we just use a pre-training model. But instead, what, we, what people do these days is, let's take the large model and let's retrain it in the little data set that you have. That's what is known as fine tuning. And that does not require so much resources in terms of uh, compute power and dollars for compute power. This can be done on a single GPU as opposed to you know, tons and tons of GPUs that were used for training large language models. And this can be done in like a day as opposed to months. So this is a model that people have been using very much these days. Let's take a, let's take a big well-trained model and fine tune it on whatever little task we want it to. So we in this class, we will also see that, or at least in this workshop series, we'll see both fine tuning and training. Okay, so how do these things work? I'm going back to the word transformers. Like I said, that is the fundamental for all these. The way it works is the first thing we do any given sentence is break it down into tokens. Remember the example I told earlier that it needs to see words separately, not as a full sentence. For example, in the first raw text is this course is amazing. And then this is broken down into a bunch of tokens and assigned unique IDs just to identify it. Next, we feed all these into a neural network. And you know, we don't need to know all these terms, logits and all. Just imagine vectors of, you know, vectors or arrays of numbers. We feed all this into an array of number, and then we do a little bit of post-processing, we'll see in a bit. And then we ask it to predict what the sentiment is. So that's it, actually. Like if you if you are expecting, you know in a sentiment analysis task, which is let's say we give a bunch of Amazon uh, reviews to the, to the model and ask it to predict a positive or negative. The truth is all we do is give a bunch of reviews as, as text input and the corresponding label, which is let's say we have a 10,000 sentences all marked either as a positive review or negative review. And that's it, that's all we give it to the machine. The machine breaks it down into tokens projects it into the vector space we talked earlier, starts doing the comparison, which is, let's say the first sentence is, I love this course. This course is amazing. And the machine predicts, oh, negative. And then the model is saying, no, no, the, the real label was positive. So what is the difference between your negative prediction and positive prediction, which is essentially known as logits? And let's backpropagate. So that's all happens. So essentially, these models are kind of learning a rough idea what uh, positive or negative means, but is it the same as human learning of what positive or negative is? Most likely not, because in our head, positive and negative has a shit lot of more things, which includes emotions and things like that. And not to mention our own experience growing up. So, but this is the bare bones of how transformers work. Um, the same slide, I think. Okay. Um, so same thing, a little more expanded, but initially we have something known as embeddings, which is kind of, a, let's call it like embeddings are the input IDs, but in, in, instead of input IDs, they are just vectors of random numbers initially, right? So all these input IDs just compared, just gets replaced with a bunch of random float point, float values or decimal values like this. And we feed it into layers, which is known as the hidden states. And then the output basically is the prediction. And these are a bunch of tasks, which we saw earlier. There's cost cell, there's question answering, token classification, et cetera. Uh, let's go into the more interesting part, which is learning um, or getting our hands dirty. If you can go to this link, If you can go to this link, usually on University of Arizona data science, click on repositories, deep learning workshop, and lecture true, lecture two, 
training transformers ipython notebook um if you are here i'll take a pause here and check if people have any questions on any other theory so far or if you are not able to get to this point in github uh yeah okay link to my slides one second yes let me just do that now itself file share lecture two deep learning okay i'm gonna paste the links to the link and view copy link done Oops, was it a wait as a meeting chat? Okay, Meg, you might have to post it in the group. I'm thinking, I was thinking that's a group chat, but okay, you should be there in the group now. Uh, but yeah, if you guys don't have questions on GitHub or if you have already reached there, let's get into the thingy. Um, okay, so click on the collab sign. If like last time, you should have this token, this particular window open in collab. Um, and I just wanted to introduce first thing is tokenization. So if you have, if you know a little bit of Python, you might have heard of this command split. So Jim Henson was a puppeteer. Uh, you can like either copy paste it or just uh, type it yourself. Um, running, run it anyway. Um, okay, so this is essentially what I mean by tokenization or simply put dividing it into words. But these days we have well-established tokenizers, which are much more smarter than a simple dot split. Because remember, I was telling you about the saying example, or let's say sleeping, right? So if we just simply do sleeping, it's gonna, of course, tell you the word sleeping is split out. But these tokenizers, tokenizers are well smart enough to get just sleep out of it instead of sleeping so that the machine is not learning only sleeping, the gerund or ing form, but it's learning the root, which we call lemma. Um, so this is how we get it. But if I try running it now, it's probably gonna complain. Okay, the sentence is from transformers import BERT tokenizer. BERT, if you remember, was another name for transformers. And it's complaining no module named transformers. That's because we did not install transformers. And here's a trick to do that in, in, in the same cell itself. Um, so you just put an exclamation mark at the starting. Last time what we did was we created a separate like, separate cell and saying pip install transformers. So the difference is it will work like this, but Colab understands that this actually is a command line command or Linux command as opposed to not a Python command. But if you are already in a Python, win Python cell like this, you just have to put an exclamation mark before it and it will install transformers for you. And this was what we did last in the last class. It'll do the downloading and stuff and yeah, installing collected package. Okay, there you go, tokenizer. We have a tokenizer. Um, and this is, as you can see, I think this is a better cell auto tokenizer because I think this is considered slightly better. Um, and also remember it says BERT base cased and this simply means um, you, these are like, um, this is this understands what uppercase and lowercase is. So if you want to learn more about uh, more other tokenizers, you just have to do hugging face tokenizers. Um, you can you'll find all different types of tokenizers which you can use in this page. Um, okay, so let's see. Now that we have a transformer network, what does a tokenizer? Sorry, now that we have the tokenizer from BERT or transformer, what does it do? So if you remember, I was telling you this converts all, splits the sentence, of course, converts it into unique IDs. In this case, it just assigns a random number as long as the, the word is unique so far. But remember, we are, we are using just one sentence at this point. So if you really wanna see the text instead, you can just call tokenizer.tokenize and ask it to print the tokens. So, yeah, so here, this is what I was telling you about splitting. So now it is slightly overdoing it when the sentence was using a transformer network is simple. It, it, the trained tokenizer, remember this is also a neural network model which is trained. None of this is like rule based in the sense a human sits and writes all the linguistic rules. This is all learned by the machine. And apparently the machine learned that the word trans is much more frequent on the internet, right? So 
it thought the word transformer is two separate words, trans and former. Let's see what it does. Using a sleeping network is simple. It doesn't change anything. Nope, it's, it understands sleep and doesn't convert it to sleep, sleeping. But anyway, this is a lot, of, lot more going on in there, but this is the standard tokenizer you would use if you had, let's say, let me give us an example of something which we are working on. Uh, doctor notes, like we were given a huge set of doctor notes, just people typing up things uh, in flowing English, which is our spoken English, and doctor saying this patient arrived at with this, um, this symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the very first thing we do. We use a pre-trained tokenizer to separate it into these unique IDs. Now, the kind of same thing, but um, this is a different model instead of BERT. There's, like I said in the page I pointed to, there's all this, you know, distal BERT, for example, is a very lightweight BERT as opposed to a complicated BERT base or a BERT large. Um, okay, and the only thing is checkpoint is more like, let's, this checkpoint simply means this model was already stored in hugging face, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Let's give it multiple sentences, same thing, raw input, but the tokenizer this time has, tells you the same thing, but in matrices, not vec not arrays. So it's just two dimensional array at this point. Uh, you don't have to worry about padding and truncation for now. It's basically, I can give a quick idea that padding, so the if you remember, neural networks essentially want things in vector, in terms of vectors or arrays. But the problem with, any calculation in that involves matrices is that it needs an n cross n matrix, which is if it is three rows, it always has to have three columns. It has to be a square matrix. So which is why we actually, like for example, in this sentence, you cannot get a square matrix after a tokenization because the first sentence has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, almost 10 words and second one has only four. So we just say padding true. Right, so we added extra zeros to it. That's all uh, padding means. Okay, so now the only thing once we have the in, once we have the tokenized data is next thing is let's initialize a model. So if you remember, if we go back to the picture, this is these are the two main things. We tokenize the data, we give it to a model, and we give the predictions along with it. So we'll, we'll see the predictions in a second. Um, so now from transformers, instead of pre-trained tokenizer, we are importing something known as auto model. It's just a base class that is used for all the good models. And again, same thing, which model do we want to use? We are gonna use this one, right? And if you do that checkpoint, it'll download digital bird if it has not. It's been fine tuned for English. I think SST is, Sentence completion, I don't want to bet on that. I forgot it's fine-tuned for a particular task. Remember we mentioned fine-tuning earlier that it is basically taking the big network and specifically training it for one task. Okay, so next what we have to do is once we have the model, okay, we, don't, we didn't mention what inputs is, that's not gonna work. Yeah, okay, I think I missed converting that into inputs. Oh, no, this one, there you go. So we ran this guy, raw inputs, and now the input, this is how the inputs looks like, and we have the model initialized. Uh, and hopefully now it sees, nope, what is error? Uh, got an unexpected keyword token type IDs. All right, I don't wanna get into that. I don't know what happened there. It's probably, a, okay, so digital bird doesn't like token type IDs. It probably will be bird based before, let's see. So there's all these nuances and shades. You probably, I think you're probably better off if you just stick to bird based. I'm thinking it's gonna work, if not, okay, there you go. So that's what I'm saying. So that particular model did not need this particular extra token type IDs, but I think you're always better if you just stick to BERT base. And what we just did was tell the model exactly the same thing which we did earlier, which is let's give it a bunch of sentences and learn the sentence. So this is the command for that model over the inputs, right? So, and this, what we print here is the last shape of the hidden layer or just an introduction to hidden layer is, if you remember, this is how it looked like. Like there are a bunch of layers here, the number of neural networks or the number of neurons in a network. And this in this case is a is like 
already established because BERT is a well-known architecture. And this is the number of, uh, this is a width, 768 is a width, 18 is the depth, and two is the number of labels. Um, so let's see. And the next thing is uh, we are looking at the outputs. Okay, where's outputs? Uh oh, sorry, what happened? Uh, okay, base model with pooling. So this is what happens when you mix up models. It's okay, never mind. So basically, the idea here is the logits, right? So definition of logit is simply how much weightage do you want to give to the two classes? Remember the if the two classes was positive and negative. Initially, the model says, oh, I don't know. I'm just going to assign two random numbers, minus 1.57, negative being for negative sentiments and positive being for positive sentiments. So this is the first sentence we gave it. Where's the first sentence? Uh, I have been waiting for a Hugging Face course whole, my whole life. And it initially said, OK, I think I'm going to give it equal weights, half positive and half negative. For the second one, I hate this so much. Initially, the model is really generating random numbers. It just says, oh, I'm going to give, I think it's positive, 4.1692, and it's so much negative. And so then instead, we just, so the idea is this is only one line, but this is run, in, run on a loop for millions and millions of times until the model learns what the original label is. And here, uh, we also do a little calculation. You don't need to worry about that to to convert that, those decimal numbers into zero or one known as softmax. So that's all the model finally tells you. Here, if, if I have too much negative number higher than the positive number, I'm gonna call the entire sentence negative and it, it spits out negative. Um, and then if it other way around, if the positive number is higher, it's gonna give you the, uh, the output positive. Uh, yeah, so that's essentially that's all we need to do. So if putting it all together, this is all you need at the end of the day. Uh, if you look at it like this is the model and let's see if we can probably, I will I will fix this before I upload this. I was just playing around with this. Uh, but let's see if I can get it to print this guy. And let's see if I can get it to predict something. Okay, too much, um, too much mismatch between the logits and the model. Uh, last minute changes. Ta -da -ta -da -ta. Work, click. Ta -da. Nope, never mind. I'll I'll fix this. Anyway, this is all. My bottom line being, this is all training is. This is all training a neural network model means. You just give it a bunch of sentences, the corresponding labels, and that's it. You, it the model goes. So this you you are not seeing in a for loop, but in reality, this will sit inside a for loop going through all the sentences that you provide. Nope, not ready. Okay, never mind. So let's go to the next stage, uh, which is fine tuning a model. So I think if you go back to the same um, it all, DL workshops and you click on, where did that go? All right, fine tuning transformers. So this is a more interesting part. Like all, you almost never will train a transformer, but you would want a transformer or in this case, let's say BERT or GPT because GPT you have to pay for it. But this is how you fine tune a model. So we start, let's start and open the same thing, click on open in Colab. And once you go into the, this is the very first cent, uh, line you always have to do in a new uh, Colab environment because you need to install the transformers again and again. That's a, you know, downside of Colab, but considering all the positive things Colab prefers, that's a necessary evil at this point. Um, okay, so it's going to install transformers. And since I'm running it in a separate cell, it's going to think it's a Linux command line. But if I had combined that with all these uh, tags, it would not have worked. Okay, I had to, but I, I had to add the exclamation mark. Now, let's see. So in this case here, the same kind of things which we saw earlier. Torch is, by the way, if you haven't seen it, PyTorch is one of the frameworks on which most of these uh, neural networks these days are built on. This is from Meta uh, or Facebook. And this was originally actually written by a friend of mine, Samit Chintala. Um, he wrote the whole thing top to bottom. Um, 
the whole PyTorch framework. Um, so PyTorch, so and that is what we are doing here uh, when we can find the, where is that page? Da, 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 fine tuning, there you go. Um, if we can find the, yeah, so that's what, if you, even in the earlier page, we had seen import torch when we were doing, um, when we were trying to use the torch.size. It's like NumPy, but at a very complicated stage. Let's put it that way. It's specifically created for neural networks. So, so command line like before from transformers import auto token, auto tokenizer, auto model for sequence classification. Adam just, just accepted this as it is. I don't want to get into what Adam is, it's something known as optimizer. But for now, you know, we start with BERT base uncased. Um, we are, let's say in this case, we are predicting. Yeah, so we are using it, the one of the pre-trained models, which is BERT base uncased. Uncased, I'm a mess, sorry. I've been traveling the last 24 hours. Um, and then we create the, give it, give all the sequences, right? So remember the goal here is to take a well-trained model like BERT base uncased and give it all these sequences which is in, let's say, remember the rare disease or some kind of a data set you have in plain text, and we are gonna give it as sequences. We use a tokenizer over it and labels. Remember like, okay, last time I did, I, I know I did not deliberately talk about labels, but this is exactly what I was telling you that we are telling the model two of these labels. We are saying the first one is one, in this case, one is positive and zero is negative. But the truth is we are not even mentioning that to the model. We are just saying one and one. So, you know, for the model have, has no idea what the word positive or negative means. We could probably have said, okay, the first word is um, zero or let's say second one is this course is amazing. Okay, good. So instead of this one, I, I hate, I've been waiting. Uh, okay, and let's make it a negative sentence, right? Okay, this course is terrible. So the way you would send the label is, zero for the first negative label and one for the second label really doesn't matter. If you swap it, doesn't matter as long as you're consistent with all your data points. So let's say you have a set, the equivalent of this in medical field will be, you have a sent of bunch of sentences, which is, you know, symptoms, for example, symptoms of, of, a, of a disease. And then what we will do is we will take, let's say there are hundred symptoms of a disease. We will take 100 symptoms of an, another random disease, add it to the same data set, and start marking these labels. For example, is this yes disease or no disease? Because the first 100 are symptoms of the given disease we are looking at. So it's one, and the rest is at zero because those are random ones. And this is all you need to do. Like this line, like I said, you might want to just copy paste as it is. I don't want to get into details of what an optimizer is. Um, and this is all the sentence. All you do is model dot batch dot loss and loss dot backwards and optimizer dot step. And this, that's it. This is how you fine tune a model, but sure you need, this will probably go into more batches and batches and for loops, depending on the size of the data set. But since we have only two sentences, we are just using that. And that's it. This is your entire fine tuning core of the fine tuning process. I'm hoping I didn't mess that up this time. Uh, if you want to play around with some data sets, there are some well-known data sets known as, yep, no module name transformers. Did we not install it? All right, so let's do, I think this, oh, I remember this, like, yeah, this guy has a problem that it, um, Colab has a problem. It probably resets the session and stuff. I don't think it'll happen to you. I just mess around with this too much. Uh, Okay, so if you really want to play around, you should look at a data set known as Glue. Uh, this is a very well you know, known data set in the world of natural language processing, and it's simple. It basically has a bunch of collection of sentences uh, of the type, the cat sat on a map, Matt, the cat did not sit on a map, and the label is minus one, which is essentially saying uh, these two sentences disagree with each other. You know, those kind of sentence, those kind of, this is a good data set to play around with if you want to learn a basic task where you use, you know, fine tuning a model. And, you know, this thing, this particular um, IPython notebook, I have added all the ways to load a data set. For example, you know, 
the, you need to really take the only the train partition and things like that. We will get to that in the next class because we are almost out of time and I want to give some time for questions. Um, yeah, uh, the floor is open. Chat, link to notebook, link to slides. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to change the notebook. I'm going to have to write, really write out the notes. I haven't had a chance since I was traveling. Um, any questions in class or online? I have a quick question. Yeah. I was just curious, the the meaning of a sentence or the, the probability of the meaning of a sentence, is that based on the aggregate of the sentence or the an individual word within the sentence? Very good, very good. Yeah, that's a very awesome question. So short answer depends. So people, what people do is they keep first learning the meaning of the, this, the word this or not. The, the way people have been teaching this to like models are they individually learn the meaning of these sentences or words in the sentences in terms of the vectors we saw earlier. And people started experimenting with what is a good way to take, tell the machine that the sentence is a collection of words. And they realized it depending on it's depending on the architecture like BERT I think what it does is takes an average of all these individual word meanings some models do aggregate there's all sorts of tricks people play so that this is exactly the point where it stops being a science and starts becoming more engineering people are people just literally like tried all possible combinations and only thing they looked was how good am I do doing in this data set let's say there's 1 million of these sentences here if you want to download this and how good an accuracy is the model doing and that's all like the best models at work i'm pretty sure none of them had an idea why the why the aggregate was working because it just works or average was working it just works nobody's complaining so take it with a with a pinch of salt but that is a sad truth that this is how all these architectures are using learning meaning at this point. So does it calculate multiple probabilities for a sentence and then select the highest? Yes. So that is the probability you saw in the other, when mm -hmm. I was using the word logits, um, that is exactly the probability it's trying to predict. It's saying, hey, I think this machine, this particular sentence has uh, minus 1.5607, not exactly probability, but that's why we normalize it afterwards and make it a zero and one. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what the machine is saying. Let's. This is the probability. I think it is positive, and this is the probability. I think it is negative. Okay. And then the the testing of the model, or the evaluation of the model, is that just is that done using um, a training and test data set? Yeah. So I I did not mention training and test because I was planning to teach that in the next class. All right, we can leave it. The idea is that you know if you remember the whole idea of machine learning is that we train on a bunch of data sets. So even in Glue, for example, if you scroll down this, you can actually see test splits and training splits. Then the idea okay. is um, we train. Let's say we have hundred rare diseases, uh, symptoms of hundred hundred symptoms of a rare disease. But of course, if you ask the model, what is symptom number three? Is it positive or negative? It's going to say, you know, yes, for example, yes, it's a disease. Okay, I'm mixing up examples. <laughs> Let's stick to reviews. We give it 100 reviews, positive and negative. And if you ask them, is the third review positive or negative? It's of course going to say it's positive because it has seen that number before, which is why machine learning is interesting because we give it the reviews which it has not seen before. And we are hoping that this thing learned something from its experience of seeing all these sentences of positive and negative reviews. And when we ask it to predict, it gives the right probability. So yes, we are. this is the probability, to answer your first question, this is the probability that the machine thinks after training that how much this is positive or negative. Okay, all right, thanks. I think there's a question in the chat. Okay, deal workshop wiki and added a folder today's middle. Okay, thank you. Um, I can do that. Okay, that's for me. And here's a link to the today's workshop. Perfect, please check in at this link and I'll give it a minute more before I have to jump into my talk, which is exactly after this. Um, all right, if people have no more questions, um, 
yeah, if you have questions, you can also drop me an email which I can find the link to it, but sure. Okay, that's my email right there and mythonpolitizona.edu and yeah. And also give me feedback. What would you like to see in this lecture series? Because last time somebody said they would even, you know, towards the end want to learn what quantum AI is doing, especially in, in bringing in like meaning and composition and grammar and not just a bag of words. So I might touch upon that too in the end. Okay. Um, Thanks for doing this. All right. Anytime. You're welcome. All right. Sounds yeah. good, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you next yeah, time. Please check in, check in today's lecture. Maybe you can see our code or...